Welcome to Scream Therapy. I'm your host, Jason Schurz. In October of 2018, I found myself in the hospital, sitting across from a psychiatrist, who was telling me that I was bipolar. I was released with a bunch of medication and laid on the couch for about a week. I had my iTunes library on shuffle, trying to shake the hornet's nest from my head. Ever since I was a kid, I've been using music for therapy and as a way to escape. Punk rock and mental health have always been connected. This podcast looks at that connection through the lens of different guests. This is Screen Therapy. Emotional bloodletting. It's a term that brings to mind satanic rituals, or putting leeches on an unwilling participant. But in my reality, emotional bloodletting means the creative expression of a wide range of feelings. The light in the dark, joy and anger, sadness, rage. I'm a longtime fan of Boston punk metal band Converge, and the lyrics and art of their singer, Jacob Bannon. I've used Converge's chaotic music to soothe my tired brain and expel restless energy that was unhealthy for me to keep in. I once recklessly bounded down a Victoria BC street, thrashing and floor punching grass on overgrown lawns. It was 3 a.m., and my manic brain had told me to be the first person at the punk show and the last one to leave. The chaos of Converge has been my soundtrack to risky behavior, but it's also soothed me at my most vulnerable moments. Jacob finds therapy in his music and his art, choosing to leave his demons there for all to see. What people do with his creative output is up to them, as it's their interpretation. Featuring Jacob's screams and growls, Converge is one of the most intense bands in the punk scene. Their songs teem with dark emotions, but there is also light. There is always light. My name is Jacob Bannon. I am the vocalist and lyricist for a band called Converge. I'm also in a variety of other musical projects, including Umbra Vitae, Wear Your Wounds, and a variety of other uh, things. I founded the record label Death Wish probably about 20 years ago, maybe a little longer now. Uh, I do a lot of visual artwork for bands uh, related to the heavy music world. That's pretty much a nice summary of the basics of what I do. Over the years, have you been able to focus on staying healthy? Uh, define that. Um, <laughs> you know, I guess that's that kind of metric is different for everybody, right? So um, we all have a multitude of challenges within our lives, and I utilize art and music to find some sort of version of inner peace or at least uh, at the very least a, a healthy outlet for things that I'm feeling. That's what I've always used heavy music and artwork for. It's a healthy purge. So you agree with the concept of screen therapy then? I don't know if I agree with the concept because I don't know exactly what your concept is, but that happens to be my concept. Um, and that's just the way I've sort of lived my life you know i'd rather put my efforts into creating something positive out of complex emotions and uh, hopefully it could help others if they connect with it in some some way i know a lot of folks talk about how music has been such an influential part of their health over the years and using it as therapy you mentioned using your artist therapy as well can you think of how you might have been if you didn't have those outlets I, I couldn't really. It's been a constant in my life since I was. You know, I started the band that many people know me for when I was a teenager. Uh, you know, I'm 43 now, and I'm still doing the same thing. So it's been a constant. So it's always been with me. So for me to envision another version of me is very difficult to do. This is all I know. Let's focus on how you got to where you are. Do you remember being introduced to the punk scene and maybe some of the feelings around that when you first discovered it? Sure. Well, you know, like, like many people that have been drawn to heavy music and aggressive music, I was searching for, for something that had the same kind of energy that I had within me, you know, and you're looking for a voice, especially when you're a younger person and you're 
filled with a whole lot of complexities, trying to make sense of the world. Heavy music did that for me as early as I can remember. You know, even as a kid, like eight or nine years old, listening to early Iron Maiden records and Motorhead records and stuff like that, you know, I connected with the energy and the volume. And not only did I get a psychological rush from just the energy of it, the vibrancy of all of it, but I also felt connected to, you know, some of the messages and some of the volume and just the aggression in it. It spoke a language that I was trying to speak. Yeah, and then over time, as I became an artist myself and a musician myself, you know, I started adding my my own kind of narrative to those things and it, my own sort of personal take on that. And I know here I am. With Converge, how is it with those guys behind you and just the feelings about being up there and hearing that coming from behind? Uh, I don't really look at it that way. You know, I, I look at it, you know, when we're performing and, you know, we're playing together in that band or any, any other band that I'm a part of, we're the sum of our parts, right? So like, there may be a personal narrative associated with a song, but we're one sort of machine that's sort of purging a lot out of all of us emotionally and psychologically all at once. I don't really internalize all that much. You know, I don't go back and look at it and think about it. And so I can't really come up with a proper way of describing it. So it's emotional, it's fulfilling, but at the same time, it's also uh, draining. It's all things that life has to offer. When you first found your scene with your kinds of bands, your kinds of people, how was that? Because we all have a different version of that. Well, yeah, I'm a bit introverted as a person. I don't really uh, go out of my way to be all that social. And even at that point in my life, I guess it felt comforting that I found a commonality with other people that were also you know, enjoying the things that I was enjoying for their own reasons and some similar reasons. But, you know, I've always looked at my interaction with art and music as an individual thing. I don't know. I didn't really connect with a whole ton of peers through it right away. You know, I didn't like all of a sudden have this massive explosion of friends. You know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't, and I am not that social. I have a whole lot of acquaintances, but I only have a handful of friends. I've always been that way. I'm completely okay with that. What would you say some of your mental health challenges have been over the years? That's probably one of them, right? There's a whole lot to unpack there. And I don't really get into those specifics. I leave a lot of who I am and the things that I struggle with as an individual inside the art and music that I make. And I'm not really saying that as like a cop out, but you know, I don't really like speaking about things in very specific terms. For me, I like to, or I feel more comfortable and more expressive when I convey those things through song. And so that's what I do. And so all of those struggles, all of those relationships, all of those things that I wrestle with in the past and the present and the future are all in the songs that I write. That's what it's there for. And so in some ways, you can look at them as a as some sort of journal or diary of sorts of those things that i um that i struggle with and so yeah it's it's all there all the subject matter is there i've seen you guys play live a few times meaning converge you're working real hard up there it must take its toll after a while night after night um i mean doesn't everything though <laughs> you know that's the thing, right? Like, I know it's a kind of a common question when people talk about like, the physicality of, of performing and playing or whatever, or like traveling, but like my woe is me is, isn't really, um, isn't really any different than somebody who, you know, works a, a typical nine to five blue collar job that, you know, has to be on their feet all day and do a variety of things. Obviously, my interaction with people is a little bit different being like that sort of bare in front of an audience, you know, psychologically and emotionally. I feel like when I read other artists or listen to other artists talk about this subject, it always sounds it always sounds a little disingenuous. It'd be like, oh, it's so hard. I, you know, like I'm you know, physically falling apart. This is happening. That's happening. It's like, yeah, everybody is. That's what, that's what life is, you know, so it's really no different. It beats you up, sure, but 
it's part of it. It's just part of it. I talked to you years ago, and you mentioned being into bands like Rorschach and Merrill. I'm wondering, when you first heard those bands, what emotions came up? That era of punk and hardcore was pretty interesting because there was a there was a new sort of sonic character that was starting to emerge. You know, you had an amalgamation of a whole lot of things that were pre-existing, but the melting pot wasn't really truly blending all of those genres together. And so when I heard the ferocity and the looseness of a lot of what people would consider the ABC No Rio scene of bands in the New York, New Jersey area, it was, I know, it was really exciting. Probably because, you know, when you're a teenager and you're making your own kind of music, you want to be razor sharp and you want to be precise, but you don't have the technical ability to. And when you start hearing things and seeing things that make artistry out of their looseness, you know, and embrace their flaws as strengths, um, you start becoming more empowered as an artist yourself. And so I, I think I saw a lot of that in those bands at the time. They weren't polished. They were just these raw emotional balls of emotional energy. In the short film about you rungs in the ladder, which is a very vulnerable film, how did you feel about the film? How did I feel about it? It was an interesting experience. You know, I, I did it with a friend of mine who was asking me to do that for a while, my, my friend Ian McFarland, who I, I still stay in contact with. Yeah, so I felt relatively comfortable, you know, with him, just spending time with him. And what he did was record conversations and follow me around for, you know, a determined amount of time or whatever, and, you know, created a piece out of it. I know, again, I don't really look back on things all that much, you know, I'm just, I was just happy for the, you know, that he looked at me as some sort of subject that would be interesting, but I didn't really analyze it past that, that makes sense? Yeah. Did you get much feedback on it? I don't know. I don't look at feedback or I try not to. <laughs> I met from friends and... Yeah, I mean, I, I hear about it from time to time, but most of my friends don't really talk to me about that stuff or the the mu music or band stuff all that much. They just don't. You know, they know that I, I spend most of my time doing things creative or promoting other artists in some manner. And so it's not really the subject that comes up when we hang out and talk or something like that couple of things that struck me about the film one was your struggle with body image uh, even being insecure on stage can you give me your thoughts on that sure i mean I, I think most people that are performers in some way are missing parts of themselves psychologically for whatever reason feeling vulnerable at times and you know they use performance and, and artistry and creativity as something that takes them to to a place of fulfillment or as close as you can get to that point, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm no different, you know? I don't particularly feel all that comfortable with myself as to why. Who knows, man, you know? It could be a, a seed planted at a very early age. It could be a genetic thing. It could be some sort of psychological deficiency. It just is what it is, you know? I think that some people look at being creative and performing and writing as as a sort of quest for acceptance in some way but i don't really see that in it for me for me it's just a a place to put language and to communicate to people so like even the concepts of fe feeling vulnerable like that and as you mentioned i work through those in song too yeah the other thing about the film that really struck me was the idea that you had about always wanting to move forward. And I was starting to wonder if maybe there was a fear of, of stopping and being still and being with yourself. Maybe that I'm off base with that. Oh, well, you're sort of off base in the sense that I'm always with myself when I'm making something. I'm always isolated in that regard. You know, I'm not distracted in the sense that I'm working on a task that makes me sort of disembodied from all other things it's an internal process so I, I am always with myself and i'm always working through those things yeah so i don't know why that is i just i just think that you know life is short and you 
I feel motivated to leave a mark with the skill set that I have and to leave the world a better place than I see it now. And uh, I, I look at art and, you know, expressing myself as part of that process, I guess. How do you feel like you've left the world a better place or that you're on your way to doing that? Well, I'm not taking the negative energy that I feel in my life or the complex things, and I'm not um, spontaneously combusting, right? So I'm taking those things and I'm taking those subjects and taking the the things that I go through and, and I work through them through art and music. And part of that process is also letting go of those songs and letting go of that art and allowing it to just sort of freely go out there and to take anchor where it chooses to in people. And sometimes it connects with people in a positive way. That's not the immediate goal. The goal is for me expressing myself, but the the secondary effects of that are really important, you know, and I know that and I am aware of that, you know, the, the conversations that I've had with people who have come up to me in, in public or, or written to me and talked to me about how, what things that I've been a part of, how that's affected them and helped them in certain ways in their lives. It's a very powerful thing and I don't take it for granted and I really respect that relationship. So over time, doing this has taken on even more importance than it did when I was you know, a teenager, when I was just trying to find myself. I'm still trying to find myself, but in the process, I'm still able to possibly help others. You know, that's a positive. When someone sends you a message that says, you know, you saved me, you saved my life, how does how does that make you feel? It's usually much darker than that, to be honest. Yeah. It's, it's usually not celebratory like that. So every experience that I've had like that has been unique. I know, like, because I'm, I happen to be the front person in the bands, that 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 happens to, to pen the lyrics, people um, will connect with me in that way. So like the other guys don't necessarily get it like that sometimes. And so like if we're on tour or something like that, you know, I'll be talking with somebody and one of the guys will, you know, sit and listen for a little bit. And, you know, later we'll come back and be like, man, that was, that was heavy. It was a heavy day. It's not that it takes a lot out of you. It's just a, um, there's a lot of energy expelled there. Because it's not just like a nod and a handshake and say, like, cool, thanks for coming. But it's a conversation, you know, and it's listening to somebody. That can, um, it takes a lot sometimes. But it's just, you know, it's heavy. It's heavy and substantive. And, you know, I didn't necessarily ask for that role in life, but it's something that comes with creating something genuine, I think. Are you able to turn that darkness around that folks are telling you and make it more hopeful? Well, it's not up to me to do that they're already in in that process by connecting with music and art in some way, right? They're searching just like I'm searching through creating it. And even as a, you know, as a listener of, of other bands and other things and other artists, you know, I'm searching for that too. How many people do you know that only listen to happy music when they're happy? Uh, You're usually music is something that's much more complex. And sometimes what you listen to, connects in such a way that you didn't even mean it to and it kind of will help you have insight into yourself and i think that you know our band is you know one of millions that are out there doing that for people but I, yeah i'm the same way like yeah, i listen to stuff and you know i have artists that do that I have songs that connect with me and be like wow that was pretty powerful and poignant and uh, significant for me to listen to you know song a or b and, you know, when I happen to be, you know, thinking or feeling at that particular point in time, that's all important stuff. In regards to uh, what you are talking about before, about music being positive, trying to look on the cliche, but look on the bright side of things. Um, I remember hearing something about that Ian Mackay had said from Fugazi about how music, it can be positive, but it can still deal with serious issues and difficult issues. And I see Converge in some ways being in that same realm. Yeah, we, we don't unpack nearly as much, you know, socio-political subject matters as, as Fugazi or, or Ian-related projects. I happen to keep things more personal by design. But yeah, I mean, it, it occupies some similar space for sure and can, can do some of the same things. Do the folks in your family listen to the band? No, not really. What do you think they would think of it? 
Uh, I don't know. You'd have to ask them, you know, <laughs> and I don't really know. I think my wife listens to the, to our band and, you know, enjoys certain aspects of it for sure. She's a listener and fan and has been for, for a long time. I think everybody gets what they choose to get out of something, right? That's like sort of like the same kind of question you have to ask a, a listener. You know, some people would just take away that something is like hyper aggressive or super heavy or super dark or this or that, you know, however they choose to describe something. I don't know how deep some people go with stuff. This might be a tough question. In fact, I'm almost sure that it is. But when you're singing in the band, whether it's recording or live, how conscious are you of what you're doing? Is there a switch that kind of goes off or is it very pointed? It's a little bit of both, you know, because you, you're you obviously in the moment of performing, right? You're there to play live music. But there's also part of you that sort of gets sucked back into a song at times. You know, sometimes you're kind of transported back into the place where you wrote it. And that could be a very positive sort of therapeutic thing for yourself. Or if it's an older song that you become, I guess, less chained to in terms of it being a current event in your life, it might take on a different meaning to you at that particular point in time. That stuff is never the same. And then you could be having a really powerful moment that you're totally introspective and you're just really in the song. And then you get totally distracted by something that's just like happening in front of you for whatever reason. Um, like some wild, you know, comedy of errors or whatever, trips over 6,000 cables and falls down in front of you or something. It's a little bit of everything, you know. It's it's a little bit of the most important moment in the world mixed with the most meaningless moment in the world mixed with a little bit of uh, comedy. It's all it's all happening all at, all at once. Yeah, so I, I don't really try to guide it you know like i know people who are artists that like you know, have certain kind of rituals and ways that they approach playing live thinking about their songs and i just don't you know and just kind of keep it loose and see where where emotionally you go do you find the emotions overwhelming at times uh occasionally not all the time i would think that maybe um that's a tough one because i think sometimes they can be overwhelming, but then at other times, not at all. And I think that can have something to do with just being an artist that's been doing the same thing for such a long time or a similar thing, right? It's a lot. It's probably a lot more um, second nature for me to do some of those things like playing live and having to be a bit more emotionally bare where that kind of anxiety that maybe a first-time performer would feel is absent from me. So I have a little bit of a, a sliding scale there. But yeah, for sure, you can get affected. No one's above that. What are the differences and similarities between the art therapy and the music therapy? Uh, it's exactly the same. And it's all the same place. It's all you know a healthy purge. To me, there's I'm all, I'm always been pulling from the same sort of creative well. You know, I'm the well. I don't really uh, differentiate between the two all that much. You know, obviously there's like certain things that are a little more mechanical, right? If I'm doing design work, that's a, a visual thing that's more mechanical. That's myself just simply doing a task. But there's still an emotional element, you know, mixed in with all of it to to a degree. So I don't really uh, differentiate it. What has all that screaming over the years done to you emotionally? I wouldn't be able to to really answer that, I guess, because I don't have that I don't have that kind of introspection, right? I don't self reflect and go like, Oh hey, you know, I would have been this kind of guy or that kind of guy. I don't know, probably people say I'm pretty quiet. I was quiet before. I don't know. I was also a kid before and incredibly shy, but now I'm an adult and still kinda of like that too. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't, I don't know what it's, what it's done to me or how it's sort of guided me. It's just part of who I am. Thanks for listening to the latest episode of Screen Therapy. I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about myself. I was born in Powell River, a small coastal town in British Columbia, Canada. I spent more than 20 years in the media industry, managing newspapers and writing and editing for magazines and online publications. 
After my mental breakdown in 2018, I had to take a break because everything seemed impossible. I needed to focus on my recovery. I did my best to take care of my mental health while dealing with the intense mood episodes of bipolar. I was trying to help other people as well through support groups and also doing some health coaching. I'm doing everything I can and I've been getting back to the kind of work that I love. This podcast has been a big part of that. After some serious soul searching, I decided to go back to school at the age of 47. I'm doing a Master of Fine Arts in Creative Nonfiction at the University of King's College that will allow me to work from home. In two years, I should have a book written. And surprise, it's also called Scream Therapy. And surprise again, it's about the link between punk rock and mental health. I'm excited about it, but I want to be sure that I pay close attention to my symptoms and stay as healthy as I can. One of the most important things about mental health is staying positive. I'm really glad that this podcast has been a big part of my recovery, and I thank you for listening. You can connect with me at soundcloud.com slash screamtherapy. Thanks again for listening, and until next time, take care and be well. If you don't